I can see the moon up ahead there, that's not good no. is it? No, it's not really, no, but we can get round that. The pear tree observatory, what's all that about mate? Um, I had to sacrifice a pear tree to actually uh, install the observatory here, so it's remembered in this uh, memorial plaque. It was a real shame to have to do something like that, but uh, well it was the only place in the garden that the observatory could go, so it had to go I'm afraid. So anything I need to bear in mind, anything you want me to know? Or just yes. The tea's there and the bickies, help yourself. <laughs> We're about to image um, the Dumbbell Nebula M27, one of the most popular of the uh, Messier catalogue. The conditions tonight aren't that good. Uh, we have a full moon in the sky and we also have a lot of high hazy clouds. So um, it's important to choose a fairly bright target and that one is particularly well placed at the moment. So uh, we'll slew the telescope onto that and um, we'll see what we get. Let's do it, great. So this is one of the minority of objects in the Messier catalogue. It's a thing called a planetary nebula. Um, so again, slightly confusing name. As with many things, you know, Messier was doing his catalogue all about trying not to confuse things with comets. Planetary nebulae were so called because they were getting confused with planets. They look kind of small, resolved objects. And so in very small telescopes, some of them look rather like planets. But actually, they're nothing to do with planets at all. Planetary nebulae are actually the end stages of a star. This image is actually made up of four separate components that capture pretty much the whole of the nebula here. This is um, caused by the star in the middle here, which is a star very similar to our own sun, and it's used up its nuclear fuel before expanding and, and blasting these outer layers into space. We've done a video on the Crab Nebula, which is the same sort of situation, and that looks nothing like the Dumbbell Nebula. They look completely different. So the, the planetary nebulae are lower mass stars, and you don't have the very messy, raggedy structure you often see in supernovae where more massive stars explode. Even though they have sort of exploded, it's a bit of an oxymoron on this, but it's a rather more gentle explosion. The core of the star, which is what we see here, is a, a white dwarf uh, that's uh, collapsed down out of the, uh, the main part of the star. And uh, what we're seeing here is um, these jets emanating from uh, the core of the, uh, the nebula. So it takes fairly deep exposures to bring these out. And we can see also these uh, very uh, photogenic outer lobes as well. Immediately before it reached this planetary nebula stage, it was a thing called an asymptotic giant branch star. At that point in its life, it was actually throwing off some of its outer layers then. And so what happens when the thing finally blows up is that you see the explosion kind of interacting with the material that was thrown off in these previous fairly gentle phases of evolution. Is something happening at the moment? It certainly is, yeah. If you see on the screen here, we've got this little uh, fuel gauge, I call it, up here. It's taking 60 second exposure. So the light from the Dumbbell Nebula is coming across all the light years into our telescope it's hitting the CCD sensor. The way CCDs work is that they convert the incoming light photons into an electrical signal, which at the end of the exposure is digitized and read out to our computer. It's now sending the image from the CCD camera to the laptop, you can see that downloading. And here's our target. These are recorded particularly well using what we call narrowband filters. And this is a hydrogen alpha narrowband image. So the way we would produce a colour image would be to take maybe an hour or two of data um, using the hydrogen alpha, and then we'll do the same thing. We'll switch to, for example, an oxygen-3 filter, which will give us our green component. And there's a third component we can use optionally, either what we call a sulphur-2 filter or a hydrogen beta. And then those three black and white images are combined in the computer to produce a true colour image. Something has made it behave in this non-symmetric fashion. Something's made it explode in this direction and not in that direction. In those earlier phases when it was just shedding mass into space, it probably shed mass into space in a slightly non-symmetric fashion. Probably in that case it shed more of its mass into space in its equatorial plane. So actually in the, the, the plane in, uh, in which the, the star was rotating, there's a tendency for material to get shed. And so that then immediately before it went off as a planetary nebula, there was more material in the equatorial plane than there was towards the poles. So then when it blows up, it sort of takes the path of least resistance. And there's more material out here to kind of withhold an explosion, so it just sort of spurts out in that direction. Oh, are you filming? Always. Oh, sorry. No, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, the great thing is about CCD detectors, they're linear detectors. So in everyday terms, our first image was a 60 second exposure and the one we're actually just uh, taking at the moment, which I think is just downloaded, is a, 
uh, 120 second exposure, that's twice as long. So in principle, we should get twice the signal. So um, if we sort of zoom in and look here, this should be um, starting to look like a, a much stronger image. In CCD imaging, really the rule of thumb is that the more data you can acquire, the better the end result will be. And compared to the days of photographic film, these cameras are incredibly sensitive, but they still benefit from having much longer exposures. Unfortunately, we're at the mercy of the British climate in that sense. So whilst it would be nice to sit down here and maybe take eight hours worth of data on just one single filtered image, um, the reality is that it doesn't quite work like that. So we have to just get the data as and when we can. So what you see here is a relatively noisy image there's calibration noise that we can remove. As Messier object, it's a fairly bright object, but in everyday terms, this is an incredibly faint thing. Usually, I'm not that envious of people who study things in our own galaxy, because mostly they're stars and they look pretty dull, they're just little dots. The thing about planet Gebuli is they're beautiful. I mean, they're some of the most gorgeous structures there are out there, because they have a sort of pleasing symmetry to them, but actually a lot of them are very complicated in structure. Presumably they mean dumbbell in the sense of the little weights things with the little handle in the middle and the two weights on the end, which is kind of a bit like what it looks like, but actually it depends a bit about what wavelength you're looking at, but certainly at some wavelengths it really has much more a kind of a two triangles back to back rather than two round things back to back. I think the Bowtie Nebula would have been a great name. Yeah, I don't know why it wasn't called the Bowtie Nebula. Nine, so end up to nine, back to two. Okay. And then we've got... Uh, six, five, three, five, eight, nine, the rotation.